From Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 50, recorded on January 20th, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. Paul is warm, and I am freezing. <laughs> He's the smart one of the two. <laughs> this is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, we'll look at Paul's column, A Dangerous Time for America's Children, Part 2. So if you're looking for part one, we did that uh, last week. Now, in this column, Paul, you write that in the 1980s, vaccine makers were almost driven off the market. So tell us what happened there. So there was an event that occurred in April 1982 that I think was the birth of the modern American anti-vaccine movement. It was a special that aired on NBC. It was called DPT Vaccine Roulette. Um, the, the reporter who, who uh, put this together was named Lee Thompson. And so what she did was she told a variety of stories from the parents and child's point of view. And the stories were all the same. My child was fine. They got a vaccine, specifically this pertussis or whole cell pertussis vaccine, part of the DTP vaccine. And now look at them. And so you saw these children with withered arms and withered legs staring up at the ceiling, drooling, seizing. And the, the implication was that the vaccine, the whooping cough vaccine, had done it. And that just went, as we would say today, viral, although this was 1982. And so it was on, on many different news stations that picked it up. I remember in Philadelphia, there was a local reporter who picked that up and, um, and it took off. And as a consequence, parents thought, OK, great. Now I have this explanation for my, why my child has epilepsy or why my child has hyperactivity disorder or attention deficit disorder, or any kind of neurological problem. This is the reason. It was that vaccine. And so that led to lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit. And it was just building to the point that pertussis vaccine makers, even though they would increase the price of the vaccine, were having trouble getting liability insurance. So we went from eight pertussis vaccine makers to one, Letterly Laboratories, was the only company still making the pertussis vaccine. And they said, we are going to quit the business. We're out because we can't get enough protection against all these lawsuits. Um, and so we were about to lose the pertussis vaccine for American children. And with that, the government stepped in. The Reagan administration created something in 1986 called the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act, which contained the vaccine injury compensation program, which stopped the bleeding and enabled vaccine makers to continue by essentially putting a, a firewall between these frivolous lawsuits and um, and uh, the company. So it sounds to me like that video, Vaccine Roulette, is basically a lot of misinformation. I mean, how could this – who made this? Was, was there an anti-vaccine group behind it? Yeah, there was a woman named Barbara Lowe Fisher who certainly supported it. She – the name of the, the – the, um, the movie or the film was called DPT Vaccine Roulette. The, the actual name of the, the vaccine is actually T, DTP. But in any case, because it was DPT, she formed a group called Dissatisfied Parents Together, which mm -hmm. eventually became the National Vaccine Information Center, which has been a source of vaccine mis misinformation now for decades. And that uh, Barbara Fisher and others were at, at some level associated with this. They certainly saw her, Lee Thompson, who did the film, as a hero. Surprised that the major networks picked this up without fact checking. Right. So, so what happened was immediately studies were done to look at whether or not, uh, retrospe retrospectively, children who received that vaccine were at greater risk of these developmental problems as compared to those who didn't receive the vaccine. And study after study after study didn't support that. I think more interestingly, there was a study done, and this was like uh, much later, much, much later, too late, by Sam Berkovic out of Australia, where what he did was he looked at these children, now many of whom were adults, to see whether they had any sort of genetic problems that they did. They had an SMA mutation, which is to say they had a sodium channel transport defect, which means that they would have had these kinds of problems, seizures, epilepsy, et cetera, um, independent of whether they receive a vaccine. It was a genetic problem, obviously not something that the vaccine was doing. 
So as a pediatrician, you probably administered this vaccine many times, right? Did you ever notice anything untoward? No, I mean, it, it, certainly children can develop epilepsy, as was true here, um, but there was never any evidence that the vaccine increased your risk of ep- epilepsy. But we, we did, we did, or those studies were done retrospectively. They were done fairly quickly, but not enough to stem the tide of the massive amount of litigation. Why did this um, video video get made in the first place? Were there anecdotal issues with the vaccine or just another target? No, anecdotal issues. I mean, you can see it from the parent standpoint. My child was fine. They got a vaccine. Now look at them. They're they're suffering. I want to know whether the vaccine could do it. And that's fair. I think it's fair to ask that question. Mm -hmm. But it's very compelling. I mean, my wife is a private practicing pediatrician. And she um, came into the office on a weekend and was helping the nurse give vaccines. So there was a mother sitting uh, with a four-month-old child on her lap. While my wife was drawing the vaccine up into a syringe, the four-month-old had a seizure and went on to have a permanent seizure disorder, epilepsy, and was dead at age five of a chronic neurological condition. If my wife had given that vaccine five minutes earlier, I think there is no amount of statistical data in the world that would have convinced that mother of anything other than the vaccine caused it. Got a vaccine, had a seizure, now is dead five years later from a chronic neurological disorder. I'm the mother of a vaccine-damaged child. And you can understand that. You know, those anecdotes are far more emotionally compelling than studies. We currently have an outbreak of pertussis in the U.S., correct? Is it related to anti-vaccine sentiment? Yes. In 2023, we had 5,000, a little over 5,000 cases of pertussis. In 2024, we've had 32,000 cases of pertussis. And associated with that, the CDC published data showing that we have now the highest rates of vaccine exemptions, meaning parents choosing not to vaccinate their kindergartners than ever before. There are some jurisdictions where more than 5% of parents have made that choice. And as they said in this this uh, article by the CDC, we're starting to lose herd immunity. And there's clearly evidence for that now with pertussis and with measles. So you said in the 80s, after uh, all these lawsuits, only four companies made vaccines as opposed to 18? That's right. So you, well, actually, there were 27 companies that made vaccines like in the, in the mid-1950s. By the early 1980s, due, due to mergers and acquisitions, it had gone down to about 18. But by the end of that decade, we went from 18 to four. And that's because companies dropped out because of this massive litigation. And so does this, did, did this impact bacterial and viral vaccines? Yes, all vaccines. So what, what, were there just four vaccines left or just four companies? No, four companies that made vaccines. And, and I presume one of those was the polio vaccine that continued to be made, right? That's right. It's interesting that the um, National Vaccine Injury Act was signed into law by a Republican president. I'm not sure that would happen nowadays. No, you're right. I mean, Ronald Reagan wasn't necessarily known for his social programs, but he certainly stood up or his administration stood up here because had they not done that, we really would have lost vaccines, I think, or so, certainly some vaccines for American mm. children. So what exactly did that Vaccine Injury Act do? What it did, did was that, that, that if you felt that your child, first of all, you had a list of compensable injuries. So for example, if your child had a severe allergic reaction to a component in the vaccine, you could be compensated through that program. If your child developed polio from the oral polio vaccine, mm-hmm. remember this was the 1980s, you could be compensated uh, through that program as well as other things. Because vaccines like any medical product that has a positive effect can have a negative effect. And sometimes that negative effect can be severe. And so here you had now a way to compensate for that. And the way that you would do it, you would just simply file the claim. And it was much Mm -hmm. more simple and streamlined rather than going through civil court. So this took the liability away from the company. That's right. You couldn't directly sue the company. You had to go through this court first, although you could if you didn't like what had happened mm-hmm. in that vaccine injury compensation program, you could then go directly to the company. But the, the vaccine injury compensation program, if anything, was over generous, meaning that they clearly compensated mm-hmm. for things that weren't caused by vaccines, like hepatitis B vaccine is a cause of multiple sclerosis, could be compensated even though hepatitis B vaccine doesn't cause multiple sclerosis. So it's, you can understand it at some level. I mean, if you're mandating vaccines for, for children, if anything, I guess you can understand overcompensating rather than undercompensating. So in the end, what was the effect of this uh, injury act on, on the vaccine manufacturers? It stabilized vaccine manufacturing in this company, in this country, and it stabilized vaccine research in this country. Otherwise, we would have been in trouble. And, and that's why I, I fear that this uh, program, if it's in any way um, adulterated, changed, 
altered, um, <laughs> we're in trouble. So the, the thesis of your article is that perhaps RFK Jr. could eliminate the protections of this Vaccine Injury Act. Uh, I don't know if he could do that or how, but let's assume he could. What would happen? Well, so, so let's say that, that he has constantly railed against all vaccines, but especially, for example, the human papillomavirus or HPV vaccine. He thinks that it causes chronic fatigue syndrome and other problems, and that, that that's all being swept under the rug by the federal government. He could say, you know what, I'm going to take that out of the vaccine injury compensation program and just let it suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous civil litigation, and it will drive it off the market. He could do that, or he could do that with other vaccines. Now, now the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, or the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act, is a, a, is a federal program. I mean, it is through Congress. So he would have to work through Congress to do that, I think. I don't think he could do that unilaterally, but mm. it's like anything goes these days in some ways. Yes, so presumably Congress would have the overruling hand and they would be the and, and president too i suppose since reagan signed it into law the president could sign it out of law i suppose right uh, i it's possible i think it, it it does worry me because absent that program um i think companies could leave vaccines vaccines Certainly. are not big money makers they're they're something that you're giving once or a few times in a lifetime they're never going to compete with drugs that you're taking every day like ozempic or lipid lowering agents or psych psychological drugs etc so um i think they're at always at risk another disturbing potential for 20 25. It's kind of um, coincidental that today is Inauguration Day also, right, Paul? Yes, it is. <laughs> Good luck with everything. <laughs> we will put a link to the column in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.